Move up, people, move up. We have like seven minutes to experience the Sagrada Familia of Barcelona, then 15 more for the Notre Dame of Paris, and then we have butter cookies to eat in Copenhagen, Guyash in Budapest, and this all has to happen within the hour, so you'll have the rest of the evening to go to the casino or get wasted in puke on street corners. Chop, chop. <laughs> When I was a boy, which was quite a few weeks ago, Two, three. at least, we had problems with the Welsh because people were buying cottages and properties in Wales. Uh, people that lived in Birmingham and Manchester and uh, particularly the, the industrial cities of the north. And when they bought those houses, the locals would burn them down. All the houses where used to be houses are turning into Airbnbs or other short-term uh, short rentals. We are seeing how we have less housing, but also how the cost of the rent is increasing. The two most under-regulated uh, fields are property market and mass tourism. You know, these, and the two meet and it's a disaster. If the tourist decides, okay, I want to spend less money, uh, so maybe if I take the bike I will get some discount, then I will use the bike instead of renting a car. And this has a direct, very big impact into our community. This is the carrot, not the stick. Julia, you're going to have to put down the stick, you know, because the tourists are not going to go away if you beat them. We get the tourists we deserve. Hello and welcome to Standard Time, our talk show exploring European matters and why Europe matters. I'm your host, Reka Kinga Pop, and we release new episodes every second Thursday, so don't miss out. Hit the subscribe button and set at least 12 alarms so you always know when an episode drops. Also, don't forget to turn the subtitles on in one of the 15 languages that we offer because we got you covered. Let us know in the comments what your mother tongue is. Today we are going to talk about mass tourism, when consumers swarm like cicadas or sometimes like locusts all over Europe, mostly in summer, to experience life in places that their presence makes unlivable. Cause boy, when we love a place, we love it to death. Most of us love to travel. Well, I only travel if somebody else pays for it. That's usually a conference or a project meeting, sometimes a particularly illustrious funeral. Most Europeans, however, do love to travel, especially those who can afford it. But popular cities across Europe cannot seem to afford receiving this many tourists. Let's start with Venice, which has a population of 55,000 people and an influx of 20 million tourists every year. Venice is a fantastic feat of medieval architecture and a unique place to behold, but most who come to behold it arrive by cruise ship and spend only a few hours there. Yes, only a few hours. How? Why? I usually need two working days to assess a small farmer's market, and then weeks and weeks to see all the libraries. Yes, the factory libraries too. These rapid visits leave Venice with little income or benefit for the local economy, <gasps> but great strain on traffic, public spaces, and of course, infrastructure. This time spent does not allow for meaningful cultural exchange. It's barely enough to put a tick on your arbitrary bucket list. Venice offers few job opportunities besides tourism and housing prices are through the roof. Owners convert what could be family homes and lower income rentals into lucrative short-term holiday accommodations, which is leading to depopulation. The city's permanent residents have decreased from 120,000 to 55,000 over the last three decades, which means it has almost halved. According to Jonathan Keats, chairman of Venice in Peril, if the population falls lower than 40,000, Venice will not be a viable living city any longer because despite all the Disney dreams, it's not particularly fun to live in a theme park, which is exactly what Venice is turning into. Amsterdam has become, in recent years, the Venice of the North, with its own 20 million tourists a year. Party tourism has centered the famous red light district, as well as the coffee shops selling weed legally, but visitors populate most of the historical old town streets for any old attraction. And let me tell you, some of them have left their good manners back at home. Typical offensive behavior includes public urination, vomiting, littering, general drunkenness, and of course, noise, and you wouldn't guess, but somehow British male tourists are the most notorious offenders. <laughs> Come on, people, there's an incredible invention called 
the toilet, where you can urinate, vomit, and text your ex while drunk, all in one place. This disruptive party tourism has led the government to create an ad that specifically targets 18 to 35 year old English men to stay away from Amsterdam, showing a drunk guy being handcuffed by police, fingerprinted and having their mugshot taken. But I'm afraid this just makes this destination potentially more epic for some dum-dums. These problems also aren't restricted to the routes of 19th century English gentry grand tours. The European wage vacuum creates wildly different prices across the continent, and a lot of people travel to cheaper countries to kick back and feel like they're wealthy for once. Even though Southern and Eastern European countries realize a lot of income from this, it also disrupts their local economies, especially when it comes to housing markets, public transport, and cultural life. This is as true in Prague and Budapest as it is in Mallorca or Barcelona, where local residents have started protesting the effects of a lopsided economy, and some of them want to cap the number of incoming tourists even. And this brings me to our guests of today. Julia Isern is a lawyer and EU Climate Pact ambassador from Mallorca. She is the spokesperson for Less Tourism, More Life. This platform has successfully brought the issue of over-tourism to the forefront of public discourse. Balint Kadar is an architect, a curator, and urbanism scholar from Budapest. He has researched urban tourism for decades now, including in Vienna, Prague, Budapest, but also in Mallorca. Ellen Gottsave is a Londoner who has lived and worked in Central and Eastern Europe for the past 25 years. He is a member of the UK Chartered Institute of Marketing and is the program director at the International Business School in Budapest. Thank you so much for joining us uh, and taking the time. And uh, I'd like to start with you, Julia. You guys have been protesting tourism and mass tourism quite fiercely recently, and for quite some time as well, but it has gotten much fiercer recently. So please tell us about the general situation of Mallorca and why you have chosen this very explicit path as opposed to mild recommendations. Okay, thank you for inviting us. So we have in Mallorca has been working on the tourist industry since the 60s, but it's been these last 20 years, the last 10 years that the situation has actually got worse. We received last year 18 million tourists in a in a, a island that we are 1 million point two. So this has made that all the infrastructures, all the systems are not enough to give answer to this increasing population. We don't have enough houses to welcome all the people and at the same time, all the workers and all the locals that we are there. We are seeing how the local population is increasing because of the import of workers, but also the tourists are increasing. And then with the problem of Airbnbification, where all the houses where used to be houses are turning into Airbnbs or other short-term short -term rentals, we are seeing how we have less housing, but also how the cost of the rent is increasing such a way that Major the Balearic Islands are the area where the rent is higher in the whole of Spain not only for renting, but also for buying houses. We see how one out of four of each uh, purchase of housing in the Balearic Islands are done by foreigners. Actually, the whole land, the whole infrastructure, everything is transforming into the tourism industry. And this is seen, for example, in the fact that local shops are directed to tourism. Big important data in the Balearic Islands, we are islands. So the land, the space is very limited. This is why the situation is more violent in the islands than in the rest of continental Europe, because we don't have space to, to build more. So we are seeing how this is impacting the land into an environmental level. And we are not investing more with um, in, in agriculture because we are prioritizing to tourism over that. So what we are asking is to diversify our economy is to, for example, invest in manufacturing companies that gives us, makes us also sovereign to have our own products, to invest in agriculture, to prioritize agricultural land over tourism land. There's already some villages in Mallorca that suffer cuts in the offer of water because they we don't have enough water. So we locals are do have to control the water that we consume, but these limits are not seen in the tourism industry. So this means that uh, the climate in the Balearic Islands is turning into something more similar to the Sahara climate. So it's turning way more hot and 
consequence of that is that it's, it won't only be more hot for us, but also for tourists. So obviously, they won't be tourists won't be prioritizing Mallorca because of that, and maybe they will go to other areas in Spain, which is going to be a bit less, bit less hot. So then, what? We are again left with any any plan B? I think there is a separate universe of arguments that we we could go into regarding the whole phenomenon of private pools and especially my favorite private pools in the close vicinity of beaches which makes very little sense to me personally to be honest. I mean I would understand if there were no water around that you would want to go for a swim not necessarily private either but you know I'm this commie who grew up in libraries and likes to borrow and share and oh, peasants um, but um, let, me, let me now come back to Alan. I want you guys to butt heads, or I don't know, maybe agree with each other, because uh, you are on a very different platform. Uh, you don't really oppose mass tourism. I wouldn't subscribe to the idea of mass tourism. Let's uh, start oh, that. come on, I was Sorry hoping. Sorry about that. No, no, no. Um, you know, in fact, I, I don't subscribe to the idea, Julia, I'm sorry, the, the, the whole concept of over-tourism, I think, is a mistake. It's not over-tourism. All the things that you've described, and I have absolute agreement and sympathy for all the things that you talked about. There are, there, there are things that are in evidence in many other parts of the, the world as well. It's not just you. It's happening everywhere with the Airbnb and all of the other things on the budget airlines and all the underlying causes, but they are planning issues. Now, if you go on and on about over-tourism, what you're actually doing is shifting the blame to the tourist. And it's not the tourist's fault. It's the fault of the, you know, the regulation. If the regulations have been in place to control the number of Airbnb units, if the regulations were in place to limit the number of incoming tourists, I mean, good basis, your islands, you, know, you can limit the number of people that come there, the number of flights. You, know, you, you have the tools in your hand. It's just that they have simply not been used. So I, I stand my ground on the fact that it's, it's not the fault of the tourists. We get the tourists we deserve. If you provide the facilities, yeah, I mean, would you agree? Yeah, yeah. If you provide the facilities, if you provide the cheap beer and the cheap flights, I mean, it, it used to be, didn't it, that you had a choice between fight or flight. Now you can have both. You can get a flight and you can go somewhere and have a good fight. Um, we don't want those you know, sort of your know, tourists, but the fact that we allow them to you know, to come in, you know, is, is 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 all regulation. I'm sorry, it's not the fault of the tourists. I think you're attacking the wrong. People people and it's not working because ever since you've started the campaign the number of tourists has considered uh, continued to rise and that's the same as in your other resorts and the great risk I believe in your, your what you're doing and you have my absolute sympathy as to why you're doing it but I think you're going about it the wrong way because you're not going to frighten away what we call in English the yobos you know, the, the drinkers the, the lager louts and you know, those sort of people who are the ones you really want to get rid of you're going to frighten away the families but the others will still continue to come. Right now, this mass tourism led to a very interesting phenomenon that everybody, in the, especially in the Western societies, has the right to spend an overseas vacation at least, at least once a year. Before, it was once a lifetime, no? Once a lifetime I went Okay, to we're Paris. talking upper middle class now, or like upwards of lower middle class. Of so course, it's but that's the message. Uh, that society gets yeah. from that's TV, sure. from that's Instagram. The, that's the so now right. the aspiration, even of the lowest uh, waged uh, worker, is this. And so, and they strive for that. So I they understand. will do everything to I do that. I remember the first and time I saw the Sia Trieka. I, I was jumping out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end, this is a social issue. That's why I think to use the term over tourism is right, because somehow humanity. Uh, got itself into this spiral, this vicious circle of, no, we cannot, we cannot live without tourism, so we cause over-tourism. And I think it's important to state that in order to understand your argument of planning, because that's how Julia can understand that there's, to fight that, it's impossible because it's a social phenomena. It's a bad social phenomena, but it's a social phenomena, 
And it's not about fighting it, but regulating it. It's 35% of the GDP in Morocco is from your tourism, 30% of the employment. And I, I'm in, with you entirely, Julia. I think that balance is wrong. I think you have an over-dependence uh, upon tourism, and there should be a greater balance. But then this is a matter of regulation. There's such a thing as carrying capacity that we teach in tourism. And one of the fundamental mistakes that is made with carrying capacity is we don't measure it properly. We look at the international tourists, who at one time were considered to be the only tourists on the planet. Then after COVID, we discovered the domestic tourists because all of a sudden we needed them to keep our uh, tourism running. But there's a third bunch of tourists, people like us, who live in a tourist place like Budapest and you you're in you're Mallorca. You do touristy things. I do touristy things in Budapest. Yeah, I behave like a tourist from Me time too, to yeah. time. From yeah, all every right. day. <laughs> yeah, you see? So you know, you've got to count those people into the numbers when you're calculating the carrying capacity. And most tourism authorities don't do that. Have you heard of our friends over at Talk Eastern Europe podcast? If you haven't, well, you should, because this is a fantastic podcast with the editors and contributors of our partner journal, New Eastern Europe, who talk all things regional, including politics, culture, culture wars included, and is just fantastic to listen to. So if you have the time, or even if you don't, give them a listen and you'll be thankful you did. And I think here very soon we arrive at the biggest uh, and most pervasive problem that many of these settlements struggle with and which Julia also opened with, mm. housing. There's a, a continent-wide housing crisis all across Europe. So somehow when unplanned and unmitigated tourism, or I would say, let's just say like commodified, I, I like to call it for myself, trash tourism. So the, the lowest sort of added value type of tourism yeah. uh, floods, your, floods your settlements and intervenes in the housing markets and intervenes in the local economy, you have a catastrophe on your hands. In many places, uh, municipalities are starting to or trying to regulate uh, short-term rentals like Airbnbs, Booking.com, whatever. Um, you can have at it. Um, and of course, there are people, especially real estate owners, who make slightly less taxed income from these sources who are very much against this kind of regulation. But at the same time, living prices or housing prices have exceeded expectable income in most places. Like in Ljubljana, you can't live from local wages, right. even if you're yeah. middle middle class. Where do we intervene here? What's the first point of intervention? Julia, what would be your suggestion on the housing housing market? So two years ago, the the government put a, a cap on the uh, on the number of houses that could be bought by foreigners, and that was actually uh, accepted by the courts in the Balearic Islands. When the government changes, this is seen as limiting the market, and the cap disappears, or we keep uh, pr promoting foreigners to buy houses. We do believe that we need to put a cap on that and we need to limit and we need to prioritize, for example, young people that can, I mean, you see the numbers in Spain, we are 30 years old when we are able to leave our parents' home because we don't have enough money with our salaries to buy a house. Oh my God, what does that leave me with three teenagers with? Oh my God. <laughs> oh, just yeah. prepare yeah. for the best. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Okay, but yeah. <laughs> you know, like the two most underregulated uh, fields are property market and mass tourism. Yeah, you know, these and the two meet, and it's disaster. But the solution is never there because it's always too complicated, and nobody politically nobody uh, dares to do a simple and effective solution. One example: nowhere there is a property tax saying that if in that property somebody is living, you know, in Hungary we have these cards of very residency. If then you don't pay anything. If not, you pay a lot of tax. For empty property, that would resolve a lot of things. For tourism rentals, yeah, you can rent it out, but <laughs> you, you need to pay a lot more taxes. That one, one, just one percentage of tax, just one simple thing would resolve it all. Nobody wants to do it. I think this brings in this huge aspect, which is not 
not talked about as often as I think it should be, and that's the fact that if you don't have permanent residence somewhere, the electorate yeah. goes extinct. Of and course. then if you only have the property owners who don't live there, then they are going to inform political decisions, which we see very acutely in the UK, for instance, where basically your voting expectations are completely defined by whether or not you yeah. own property. Yeah. Okay, but in Hungary, this is working more or less, because in the districts of Budapest, uh, majors of districts do uh, make some laws against Airbnb, against bars open after midnight, because they rely on their voting uh, residents who, and they don't really care anything about tourists because they have no uh, votes. Zika, you mentioned the UK, and I realized that when I was a boy, which was quite a few weeks ago, um, two, three, at least, they, we had problems with the Welsh. You know, that lot that live over sort of on the left-hand side of you know, the British Isles because people were buying cottages and properties in Wales. Uh, people that lived in Birmingham and Manchester and uh, particularly the, the industrial cities of the north. And when they bought those houses, the locals would burn them down. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad you haven't reached that stage, Julia, at the moment. Please don't you know, copy this as a playbook. But I, the reason that I'm making the point is this has been around for 50 or 60 years. In a sense, the whole housing crisis right now does, if not completely repeat, mm -hmm. rhyme with the housing crises of the early 20th century. Yeah. So let's say 100 years ago and 100, between 150 and 100 years ago, mm -hmm. when Europe was very rapidly urbanizing, the, these populations were basically flooding to the cities and with this urban population that was underserviced, that lived in horrific conditions and, um, and was often just seen as a problem. But it's a problem with a population that also the wealth of the city depends on. So it's not like they're not contributing, they're the primary cornerstone of these settlements growing up. So I'm, I'm looking very much to you, Balint, to whether you, you think there can be some kind of a point of intervention for a longer term time of plan, type of planning. Every city is different. And I want to give you an example, uh, which of course I, I, I uh, research, like difference between Prague and uh, Budapest, like in Prague, they had a big problem in the 90s because very suddenly tourism exploded at cities in the same time when they have privatization uh, of the property market and they actually had a restitution uh, uh, process to, to, uh, rest to re give back to original owners all the palaces of the center and the historical buildings. And who were the old owners? Well, they were the nephews. They were, you know, like people who never had anything to do with property market. So they just said, OK, I have this. What to do with it? I have rent in it, people renting it. I, I cannot maintain the building, so I just sell it. To who? Who has capital? You know, all the countries from other parts of the world who had these investors. So at the end, in the center of Prague, uh, these investors had the power to dislocate uh, local populations and create in the center a void where there's only hotel services for tourists and so on. And locals were moved out to, let's say, outskirts, not outskirts, but around the center. In Budapest, this never happened because we didn't have this restitution. So everybody in Budapest just owned its, the apartment where they lived before, after 1990, and there were no big investors buying history. Now, what did it mean? That in the 1990s and 2000s in Budapest, you couldn't see this concentration of tourism. Like in Prague, the center was empty and around the ring there were the locals. Airbnb changed everything. And in Prague, with Airbnb, all the private people could finally rent out easily their uh, uh, apartments. So the centrality actually became more dispersed and Prague could become, I think, a better experienced city for tourists and not that worst for, for locals because since 2010s, tourists became to move out from the center, to live in Airbnbs in nice neighborhoods together with locals, to explore each other's culture. In Budapest, on the other hand, Airbnb bought the new Prague that everybody in the center who had apartments rented it out for tourists. So this concentration never happened. And 
it, the carrying capacity is something that we teach, but it's very, as you said, very hard to, uh, to put exact numbers behind it. Because how, carrying capacity of what? Of a port? Okay, that we can have. Of an airport? Okay, we can have. But for a city? And, and yes, you have to count how many locals, how they will live there, and how the streets are used, and can you make little changes or big policies? The economic carrying capacity, social carrying capacity, it's not just the number of counting the bodies. There's a lot more to carrying capacity than that, and they all have to be looked at. I think just as a, as a smaller, but to me personally important addition, in the 2000 and 2010s, inner city districts in Budapest and in other big cities in Hungary very systematically uh, or systemically started to filtrate their own population and get rid of the old tenants and, and try and, and call in this kind of investment uh, money. Yeah, but, but, but look at what Budapest succeeded in doing. They created additional areas. Look at Varos Liget. You know, I remember when Varos Liget was a place that nobody would do a go. It was full of drug addicts. It was like a bomb site. Now it's a major resort area with a concert hall, a museum, you know, and decent parks. So we are expanding you know, in Budapest the number of areas, and therefore we are you know, spreading the load. The problem that cities like Barcelona have is that they are not spreading the load. The tourists, and the same is true with the Venice. It's the it's the second and third street syndrome, which I'm sure you know about. You've got the main street, which is absolutely heaving with bodies. You've got one street back where there's a little bit of stuff going on. And then the second and third streets are totally empty. Yeah, of course. Now, that's what we've got to develop and where it can be planned. But Budapest, you can learn from it. You cannot. It's a different city. Why you cannot? Because it's not one city. Right. These are 22 cities. <laughs> All districts are totally independent and they are competing yes. for better people, as you say, and you're right in that, but they actually didn't do uh, any uh, forced displacement of the population. So it was not a centralized uh, thing. The centralized thing in it was like that different districts were all setting up their own thinking of how to do it. The problem is t most tourism areas, unless you're talking about creating Disney World, you know, most tourism areas exist and we try and shoehorn tourism into it. You know, whereas with Disney, they create the site, they've got the transportation, they've got the accommodation, they've got the catering, every, you know, everything is planned, everything is limited. That doesn't happen. You know, tourism comes to these places, the streets are already there, they're already narrow. The accommodation, the facilities and everything is all already there. And um, so the challenge is to retrofit sustainable tourism policies into areas that were frankly never designed for tourism. No, because they became sought after because they were interesting places where People lived in yeah, ways that for either education or commerce or you know, the, oh, most yeah. tourism is you know, a shared thing. And that's why you know, I am adamant that we have to count the locals in our equation when we're looking at those carrying capacities. And that's where I believe we've made the fundamental error. What it brings to my mind is the kind of tourist infrastructure that is that has been built throughout the past, I think, 60 years or 80 years very vigorously, and that's countryside tourism all across Europe. And there's a lot of money being poured into it by the EU. And I, I don't seem to recognize that there is as much interest as there is development money poured into it. You know, big, big success story is uh, the rural region in Germany. All the mining and heavy industries, they of course closed in the 60s, 70s, uh, 80s, and they made this uh, European capital of culture, which was not based in one city, but in a region, and opened all the old mines and all the old uh, uh, industries for tourists, make, putting even swimming pools in mines and so on. And that became a rural destination really successful. And the other thing is like uh, bicycle tourism in uh, Austria, like in Krems in the Wachau region. Yeah. 25 years ago, nobody believed that bicycle tourists will do any good. But they strategically uh, developed that. They made, you know, these bicycle routes on both sides of the Danube, bridges and little uh, ferries and so on, a lot of little industries. Today, more than half of the tourist income of the Wachau region, which is a World Heritage region now, 
comes from bicycle tourism. They managed to live well out of that because they live of their own product, products like wine and apricots and they sell that and, and they are very happy. So that's something like in Mallorca we could recommend, you know, yes, local agriculture can be a base for tourism if it's not the cruise ships going to Palma and then see the cathedral and go back, but to disperse it and to use local resources. And when it comes to bicycle tourism, this country for the most part is criminally flat. But I want to come back to you, Julia, because you mentioned agriculture and I think in, in European development uh, discourse, even though the EU invests the biggest chunk of its, um, of its budget into agriculture, I think from the development side, it's always large scale in, uh, agriculture or most for the most part, it's large scale. Uh, industrial agriculture, but I don't think that in the case of Mallorca you guys want to grow corn as an alternative. So can you tell us about the kind of um, local sort of heritage agriculture that could develop or you are proposing to develop to make, um, to diversify um, the island's income and, and economy? Well, in the case of agriculture, it's a very specific and different topic. So what we're asking is to to planify to see the needs of the population to see what to to improve the well-being of the local population because so like we also ask ourselves the question tourism for what and tourism for who because what we're seeing guys now is that since everyone is is focusing on tourism industry we are losing a lot of traditional jobs in the agricultural sector. And with that, we also lose our culture because aligned with uh, with agriculture, there was a tradition, there was music, there was ways of living. What we need is to diversify. We cannot support, uh, we cannot have uh, an economy of that 45% of our economy uh, derives from tourism. So yes, we need a plan. We need a um, planification with the government that understands that it cannot just let go uh, as it organically is going because then who has more power are the the big uh, lobby industries and they obviously have their individual interests which it's nowhere near prioritizing the interest and the well-being and the uh, rich uh, the richness the, um, the economic interest of the local population if you like what you see, and if you manage to make you laugh at least once, please support our work and go to patreon.com slash eurozine. That's the magazine presenting this show. You can pledge as little as five euros a month or whatever you can afford, and you'll get access to bonus materials, early access, and even get to suggest topics and questions. Now back to the show. You take us back to this, which is very close to my heart, the question of the culture of tourism and both both the role of culture and local cultures in tourism, because supposedly we're going there for this in the first place. Like if I go to Copenhagen, I don't go there to see the same old H&M that I see in every main street. I go there because I want to smell cooking butter on all the streets. How does the culture of tourism then change? How do you intervene in this field? Because it's not just like one singular regulation. Mm -hmm. And if you just go by pricing up, that means that from the incoming people, you're going to lose a gigantic proportion of those who just can't afford to go for luxury. Tourism is not as price sensitive as many people think it, it is. It really, the price elasticity of tourism is really, really very limited indeed. I think the radical solutions are missing from, from, from politics. And one of the radical solutions, for, for Mallorca, let's, let's get this example, because, because I've, you have I've been Mallorca. there and, and I had this idea there, because actually, I didn't only see over tourism, I saw also the rural landscape struggling, like in Hungary or like in all Europe, on getting people work in the agriculture. In Mallorca, there's nobody to take care of that plantations because it's manual work. And who wants to work that? Well, correct me if I'm not right, but the young people uh, will definitely want a desk job or a superior job or even to be a waiter at a cafe, but not to pick the olives and to care about the land. Why don't we turn it saying that we have to limit the number of tourists going to Mallorca? What if we give a green card to every tourist who spends five days in an olive farm, visiting every night something else, and then a weekend is for them for the beach? That's the entry, you know? That has a package, that has a cost, and then... Wait, 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 spend, spend five days in an olive farm 
tasting working, and spending money on working on the farm. Oh, you want to get yeah. unskilled labor yeah. into and these I, plantations? And my son, I would, have you I would ever been to a harvest? Of course, I mean, I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm I don't want to be crass so with you, but like, I'm a oh my that's why God! My arm. You know, it's not a new idea. I know. It, that's it, it happened worked. in England. You, know, at the early part of the 20th century, the end even of the 19th century, that poor families from London would go out to the hop fields in Kent and pick the hops Just for summer. the yeah, and they would work during the day, and then they would have a big party in the evening. Of course, because the breweries were running it, the beer was free, and they laid on entertainment. So they worked during the day and they partied, they had the fresh air, they had the, you know, the exposure to the countryside and everybody was a winner. What I'm trying to say to, to try to treat tourists and tourism as a resource. It is an economic resource, everyone knows it, but is it enough? No. As a resource, because for me, uh, over tourism exists because people want too badly to go and see new things. That's a social issue, it exists. So why not use that and say, okay, you can go but. You can only go if. You can only go if you contribute to local society in some way. Picking olives is one way, but there are other ways. Picking up rubbish off the beach? Okay, yeah. of course. okay. Right. I can yeah. imagine that's true. Yes. Teaching English to the locals? That's, that's what I want to say, right. thank okay. you. Okay, there we are. That's Sorry, good. Julia. <laughs> yeah, no. Just what you're talking about is, I, I believe it's a great solution and it's what is called regenerative tourism. It's a new model, it's an innovative model of tourism where the local not only doesn't add something negative, but it adds something positive. If you want to, uh, to promote certain kind of behaviors, for example, using the bike instead of using the car or using less water or prioritizing going to a local restaurant, then you would get a discount on your final account in the hotel stay. So this would be a way, not only picking olives, that I would love to see that, to be honest. <laughs> it's much harder labor than people imagine. It would be easier, right? If a local if a tourist decides, OK, I want to spend less money. Uh, so maybe if I take the bike, I will get some discount. Then I will use the bike instead of renting a car. And this has a direct, very big impact into our community. This is the carrot, not the stick. Julia, you're going to have to put down the stick, you know, because the tourists are not going to go away if you beat them and throw things at them and, you know, spray tourists, go home on the walls. They, they might come specifically for the stick, though. The, the, I mean, depends on the tourists, yeah. But on, honestly, you know, that, that sort of strategy is not going to work because, as we know, tourism is incredibly resilient. You know, um, with all the things that go on in the world, the tourists just keep coming back. Obviously, we are not asking tourists themselves to, oh, no, don't come. Everyone travels. We understand that. We need to, to reset our mindsets. And as a, as a basis for that, we believe that we need to claim that tourism is not a right. It's a luxury. Maybe we need to rethink. Maybe we cannot travel as much. Maybe we cannot go for a weekend and visit, I don't know, Germany. Maybe we would love to, but we need to change our minds, maybe, right? I'm very much in favor of shorter distance tourism as well. Like whenever somebody here uh, tells me that they want to go somewhere exotic, I tell them, why not go to Kosice or Zrenja? I mean, who knows? Maybe Brasov, that's very different. <laughs> so I think the perspective also with what you want to see and what you actually see when you go there is is kind of a miss, at least in, in popular culture, culture for sure, like a hop on a plane as if distance didn't matter and land somewhere for a weekend where I don't really see the place, I don't really engage with the place. I think it's all about the off offers that, that these places uh, have and it's about the mindset of people. You know? and, and to take a photo in, in a seaside or in Paris, that's meaningful. To take a photo in the country here, it's not meaningful for, for them. But that's about education and media and, and uh, policies and politics on how to change that. And saying, no, what is meaningful is when you have a great time and you experience something authentic. And once uh, society and people in society will find peace in uh, consuming less, like less travel, less air, less mice, less whatever, and living more, living more experiences, living more yes. authentic yeah. and yeah. healthy yeah. and good things, yeah. then they will not need to travel more than, than what they can travel by their own without airplanes and cruise. Maybe we all need to read a bit more Goethe and just know that <laughs> once you actually make it to Rome, you're going to be so disappointed on the Colosseum. It's not going Actually, to I have good news for you, because all the research that we're doing shows that people are moving towards experiences.
You know, it's the um, experiential side of tourism. Yeah, initially, tourism in, with the Industrial Revolution, when people could get on a train and go to the seaside, it was all about laying on the beach and chilling out. You know, but change is as good as a rest. Then we started being focused on going to destinations. But most people, certainly by the time they reach my age, they've done their bucket list. You know, so you, then we move towards experiences. Julia, I want to sort of come to you for like a closing question. You as a Mallorcan, what would be something that you really want to see as a tourist and what what attitude would you go there? Uh, I don't know. I think at this point I, I've also become very critical with tourism. So I am I try to, well, to do the less tourism as possible. So what I prioritize is to go to places where I have friends or where I know people. That person shows you their perception of the city, of the island. I love, for example, to receive uh, friends uh, to Mallorca and show the island because it's so beautiful and I love it so much that I love to, to share this with others. So I believe it's the same thing when even if you travel to the other side of the world, if you do it with someone from there, that then you're sure that you are not a product, right? You're not sell a, a whole experience because someone in a desk decided how to, what it was good for to take money from you, right? So this would be more than a place. I would say that this would be my top experience for tourism. Ellen, I understand that your bucket list might have a lot of ticks, but maybe there's something left that Actually, you really want to see? Actually, there is one, and we're going to achieve this in November. We are going to Africa to a wedding of some friends of ours, so we get the chance to experience the real culture of Uganda. We will fly into Entebbe, we will go to a local village. There will be three different weddings, that, ceremonies that they go through, and we are just so much looking forward to that. So oh, that's, wed that, weddings are really the yeah, best. Yeah, that's going to be Even absolutely bad amazing. Even good. Yeah. I, I'm told I have to wear a long white dress, mm. you know, really, sort of like a nightshirt. But, also uh, as a climate control yes, effect, yes, it's going to work, yes, I promise. Yes, so that, 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 that's me. That's the last right. tick in the box. Balint? My dream vacation is in a place where i already been and I know it, so I can really immerse myself. And to be with people that are not my people, but we know each other and we reconnect. So it's... Mm -hmm. Also at community, but but of course, if, if it uh, has to be something new, it's still the same. Like I have to know the language because then I can understand the place, hmm? and I have to be able to move freely, which is quite difficult in certain parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So it's best to have somebody who is local, and we are yeah. together. So if we fulfill these things. So in a country where maybe Spanish, Italian, of course, English, these languages are spoken and uh, I can move freely and have some locals to move around, then it's my preferred destination. Yeah, that's Disneyland. <laughs> 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 Who's local there? <laughs> <laughs> well, they do speak English and Italian and French. Uh, thank you so much. If somebody is in desperate need of a tourist destination and wants to plan without the locals in place, I highly recommend touring the grand, uh, grand libraries of uh, Helsinki and all the Baltic countries. National Library in Riga is fantastic, it's spectacular. It looks like a zikura, it's amazing. And there's a piano left in every second corner for some reason. So um, I would encourage everyone to check out these libraries because they are not the conventionally touristy places, but there's local life as well. And sometimes a really nice canteen. Thank you so much. <laughs>we have very effectively explained to Yulia everything she already knew. Now we want to know, would you consider traveling off-season? Have you tried it already? Do you want to ban Airbnbs or maybe encourage them? And what's your favorite kind of vacation? Share your thoughts with us in the comments below and give us a like and a subscribe while you're already rummaging down there. This talk show is presented by Eurozine and if you haven't heard of it, you should check it out right now because this online magazine trades in a scarcity item and that's insight. Eurozine publishes thoughtful long-form articles from more than 100 partner journals across dozens of European languages 
and you have access to it all for free. Display Europe is the force behind this project. It's a content sharing platform that offers you articles, podcasts and videos about European politics and culture in 15 different languages. And yes, they don't abuse your user data. I know it's unbelievable, but possible. Go check them out at displayeurope.eu. This program is co-funded by the Creative Europe Program of the European Union and the European Culture Foundation. Importantly, the views and opinions expressed here are those of the speakers and the authors only, and they do not necessarily reflect those of the European Union or the European Education and Culture Executive Agency. Neither the European Union nor the EACA can be held responsible for them. Not that we would mind them taking advice from us, though. <laughs>